Hello. This is number four in a series of four, the Elevator Business Essentials series. Number one was around planning. Number two was strategy. Number three was marketing. Number four is about people. So planning, getting the numbers in place. Strategy, the bigger plan, the roadmap, how are we going to make that happen? Marketing, how are we going to get the right customers that we really want to buy from us? And then finally, we've got number four, which is the teams piece. Teams, 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 people, 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 people. And I have to say, I ran my first business when I was 21, and the biggest problem that I've always had has been around people, around getting, getting the right people to do the right thing in the right way for me. And I, and I openly confess that I find people the hardest piece. And people is the kind of the, the the, the backbone and the, 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 the central piece of, of the elevator program because without the people piece, nothing else happens. But even when you've got the people piece, you kind of end up starting working on this all over again. I mean, that kind of science seems bizarre, but that's what's kind of going on. It's, it's, it's always about people. And for me, people is the toughest thing. We've heard all these people are your most important asset thing and all that. And that's kind of, uh, that just kind of doesn't quite do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than that. So. Let's just uh, frame what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about people. I'm going to give you a few ideas and a few thoughts about how you need to put the people at the, the center of the business. Why are people important in the businesses that I run at the moment, and I run several? They do everything. It's, 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 it's because of them that the business is run. So if I don't get the people bit right, it's absolutely no good at all. Likewise, for agencies, it's exactly the same thing. Your people banging away on keyboards and making stuff happen. And you need to have them engaged and involved, bought in. You need to have the right people. Without the right people, nothing happens. So, elevator program. 250 agencies selected because they're the ones that have the potential to grow. They're the, they're the exciting ones to actually make happen. They're the ones who are given, given priority access to things. They're the ones... 250 are special. And my involvement in the program is I run the coaching program where we've got 30, 35 agencies working with me, mentoring, coaching, director hot seats, and spending time in, in one day workshops. Those directors making stuff happen. So that's the, that's the framework. And the framework behind that is, as you'll recall, you know, the, the set your vision, nurture the digital leaders, transform the business, strengthen the team. So that's about education, but that's also about the, 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 the more softer stuff. Uh, win new clients, marketing, celebrate success. And then start again. Start again. It's like you're always building up, building up, building up if you go to the next level, the next chapter in the book. So two quotes. One from Peter Drucker, one from me. Peter Drucker says, culture, how we do stuff around here. Culture, what our people do. Culture, the, the, the smell and the taste when people go to your, or they phone up or they look at your, your organization or they go into your offices. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. In other words, it doesn't matter how great your plan is. It doesn't matter how sexy your plan is. It doesn't matter how compelling the numbers are. It doesn't matter how, how good that plan looks and that strategy looks and how clever it is and how cunning it is and how, how if you've not got the right people in place, it won't happen. It's a no-brainer. And the really interesting thing for me is that as agency owners, as people running agency, we tend to be really good at the... The, the technical, how this stuff works. We tend to, we tend to have a, a real fascination with, with systems and processes and, and, and how this stuff comes together. And if we do this, that'll happen. But it's very transactional. And the people thing is about relationships, not about transactions. So agencies, I would argue, are disproportionately poor at managing their people. And there's a kind of a compensation thing. We'll have a ping pong table and a darts board and people can come in when they want and we'll take everyone off to the swimming pool. So there's a kind of a compensation going on. But actually getting people to stay loyal and not shoot off to the next agency down the road for the extra 50p an hour 
that's the conundrum. Actually having people feeling like they're part of the family, actually wanting to work with you, actually going the extra mile, actually feeling that's the piece. But strategy we can nail, marketing we can nail, planning we can nail, the people piece is, is, is for me the toughest piece. Which leads me on to my next quote, which is really just in praise of the dull, boring stuff. So we didn't go into business to do spreadsheets. We didn't go into business to do uh, health and safety. We didn't go into business to do KPIs. We didn't go into business to do keeping all the staff happy and all that stuff. But actually, the dull, boring stuff is the thing which separates the mediocre from the really great businesses. The businesses which nail the dull stuff, the businesses that have the systems and the processes and the organization, and they measure stuff, and they charge for it, and they collect the money. All that stuff, you need to have that in place. So you need to have someone in your organization who just loves doing that stuff. In the same way, you need to have someone who loves selling and marketing. In the same way, you need to have someone who loves doing the work. And we just need to recognize that there are different sets of things going on. But if we're talking about dull, boring stuff, I think that comes in with the HR and the people thing, because there is a lot of paperwork, a lot of stuff which just needs to be ticked off, annual assessments and so on and so forth, job descriptions, that whole piece. And the tighter you are on that stuff, the better you're going to be. So, before we talk about the team and the people, let's just talk about you, the leader. There seem to be like almost four stages or four types of leader, especially as we imagine the, the, the agency as it grows. We start off with the artisan. This is the character who's great at doing their job. God, they can write awesome code. God, they can, they can squeeze so much out of a campaign. They, they are so good at knowing their stuff. They're so up to date on the latest the latest spec and the latest way of doing things. They know nothing about what they should be doing for their people. They know nothing about training up their people. They know nothing about having the, 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 the agency organized so that other people can help. So on the whole, it becomes a bit of a disaster as the artisan just does their own thing and lets everyone else do, do else. You may be an artisan, especially small agency owners. They tend to be. The next step up is the hero. They're the ones who figured out what needs to happen they haven't actually told anyone. They now understand about billing and proposals going out on time and delivering on time, all the systems and processes you need in place. And what they do, because they've not shared that with everyone, they kind of roll their sleeves up and they come in and they rescue people. And they're fantastic because they rescue everyone and they go, this is what you need to do. Let me show you what needs to happen. This is how you do it. I'll do it for you. And they take over everything. And then they grumble that they're overworked because they're not letting their people do stuff. So it's kind of like they know what needs to be done. Ideally, and I, you know, man, many of you watching are probably heroes, ideally the hero suddenly realizes when they've worked too many weekends and their partner's giving them a hard time that they need to train up, they need to organize the organization and they need to train up their people. So they do that. They send people on courses, they create structure and process, they have lines, they create little hubs or little, little pods of organization, and that's fantastic but they just can't leave it alone. In some senses, they're actually worse than the hero because the hero just kind of takes over because the hero knows what to do and no one else does. But the meddler has trained everyone up to do jobs and given them job specs and given them job profiles and explained and, and contract what they have to do and they've created a customer journey and, and where things should go and so on and so forth. But the meddler then interferes. So having empowered people to run the agency, to run, to run the pod or to, to be in charge of PPC or search or whatever it is that people are in charge, they then interfere. They can't leave it alone. They interfere. So their presence is everywhere and the business doesn't run very well. In the artisan, the hero and the meddler, you constantly get problems from staff feeling that they're undervalued, uh, the owner's taking over, they're not letting go. And then the final piece in this is the strategist. And the strategist is the one who has figured out that they need to train their people and have systems and processes for their people. And they need to kind of let go and allow their people to run it. So the first three are people who work in the business. And it's the fourth, the strategist, that actually works on the business. And that feels really strange because no longer are you doing what you're good at. You're no longer coding. You're no longer writing. You're no longer selling. You're actually being a managing director. 
But if you want to grow the business beyond you know, five or 10 people, you need to get that strategic mindset in place. And that's tough because most agency owners, if certainly if they start as a startup one person business, they go through all these stages to end up at strategist. So just think about what your influence on your people is. Do you let your people have the space that they actually deserve and want? Or do you, like I often do, meddle? Oh, why don't you do that? Have you thought about that? Here are the questions I get all the time, you know, coaching 34, 35 agencies. Endlessly, I'm asked these questions. How do I select? How do I find? How do I recruit? How do I motivate? How do I reward? How do I build the team? How do I retain? How do I engage? How do I get by? How do I remove them? The list is endless, and I think the people thing is just, it's just a vast, it's a vast wasp nest of, of difficulty and, and awkwardness. And if you're not good at this stuff, you need to find someone in your agency who is. But how do you select, find, recruit, attract? Well, I mean, the simple answer is you, you make your agency the agency that people want to work at. You become the employer of choice. So that involves making it a really lovely place to work and creating the great team atmosphere and rewarding people, recognize, recognize that you will. How do you motivate? How do you reward people? Well, I think you need to recognize there's kind of three different people. Person one only wants money. Person two wants recognition, and person three wants affiliation and, and groupiness. And, and depending on who you're talking to, they will, and, and their stage in life, they'll want different things. So one of your employees may be saving up for a, for a mortgage, so they want, want financial reward. Uh, another may be uh, not in that stage of life, and they just might want to, be, to feel like they're part of the family. So you can reward, and I would argue small rewards are better than big rewards, small public rewards, small private rewards. You might have a little, you know, almost like a showcase of 50 pound rewards, 100 pound rewards, 200 pound rewards. So they could be a, a spa or a haircut or a theater ticket or a hire of a Ferrari or a day off or uh, guitar lessons or working in charity. Different things float different people. So I think you need to have team rewards the team's done really well, we benefit. Individual rewards, you've done well or you've done well. And you probably may also want some permutation of that, but also as you manage people more, you'll give people targets. If they hit their targets, they need to be rewarded. How do you build the team? You've got to spend tons of time with these people. The team doesn't just happen. You need to find ways of working, engaging, sharing, laughing, creating, creating the... Um, the, the, the very space and the very thing that you actually want, want it to be. And that has to be built by design. I think you need to deliberately think through what sort of atmosphere, what sort of culture, what values do you believe in and what values do you want running through the business. So that's actually about being really deliberate about we are open, honest and transparent or we are about making money or we are only about working with customers we enjoy or we are about... about um, you know, only working till Friday at five o'clock, or we are about only working with exciting big, or um, uh, we will have a good time. There's something about, about being clear about what it is that you want to do, and you build deliberately. It doesn't happen by accident. How do you retain people? All of the above. How do you engage and get buy-in? That's about you talking and sharing and finding people who can talk and share. And I think that very often for agency owners, they're either so focused on making sales they forget about their people, or they're so focused on technique and technology that they're not great people people. And then how do you remove people? You've got to do that legally. You've got to have the processes in place. And to my mind, I've, I've learned the hard way. If in doubt, you sack people early, not late. You don't wait if things aren't working, you nip it in the bud because it's much harder to remove people when they've been with you a year. It's much easier when they've been with you a short period of time. And if you're trying to employ someone and you can't find the right person, then don't employ second best. You've got to try and take the risk and find someone. And it's tough because it's the one thing, the one thing that's really tough is the people thing because everything else you can find an answer for. But the people thing is like, it's like a magic. Uh, and, and there's a belief there's a silver bullet, but actually you've just got to have people really high up in your priority. You've got to be thinking about your people because it's your people that, that make stuff different for you. I'd like to think that in your organization, as you grow it, you, you may well find it easier to, to think in terms of hubs or, or pods. So in any organization, you've got three types of people. You've got 
the finders, people at the top, they go off and get the work. They tend to be the account directors or the sales directors. They go and get the piece of work, account managers. We then have the minders, who might be the traffic managers, um, or alternatively, they're the sort of the, the middle management who are kind of controlling stuff. And then we have the grinders, which I rudely call the, the digit monkeys, the people banging away on, on computers, making stuff happen. Now, the finders, you might only charge out sort of 20, 30% of their time, but a very, very high price. The minders, you might charge 78% of their time out at a slightly lower price. And the grinders, you probably charge out 100, maybe even 110% of their price, their time at, a, at an even lower rate. So the, 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 you have this triangle, which might go one finder, two minders, six grinders, six, two, one. That's a hub of nine people. And, and now, when you want to grow the agency a bit more, rather than just keeping on filling the same hub, it's probably easier to create a brand new hub beside it with a finder, some minders, and grinders. So you go from nine to two groups of four, build them up. And, and this is a way that you kind of keep the, the size of individual units quite tight. You have one person responsible for all their activity. People know who they're working for. You'll have different specializations and different skill sets, so you can uh, interswap or, or sell time to each other. But this idea of finders, minders, and grinders is really interesting. If your triangle's too wide, there's, it's very difficult for people to get employed, go up, going up, going up the, the ladder. If it's very narrow, it's very difficult for people to get, go up the ladder. So you need to think about how wide or how narrow you want this to be and, and how, how you want to duplicate it in the financial implications. So this is just a lovely idea which has really helped me grow several agencies uh, and consultancies uh, understanding the shape of these models and how we're going to grow, grow the hubs and, and recognize where we make most money in our, in our particular agency. So what's the truth? The truth about running an agency, the truth about our people, is that it's, it's not about the money, it's not about the job conditions, it's not about the, the, the free membership to the, to the sports club or the perks. It's about how we make people feel. And, I'm, and I, I, for one, am not great on this touchy-feely stuff. I, I'm the first one to admit that. But I think when it comes to employing people, the truth is, how do they feel before they, before they join us? And how do they feel when they've joined us? How do we make them feel about themselves, about their private life, about the job they do, about the organization they spend 40, 50 hours a week with, and about what they do at weekends? And I think that this, this truth, which I think you know, all HR books seem to miss out for some reason, is, is at the heart of it. And if we can understand how, how to make them feel better, if we can understand how we can contribute to them feeling better about themselves, then they just pay us back you know, 10 times more than the work that we put into them. So in terms of this program, the people is the difficult thing. And it is soft and soft, touchy, and it is, it does feel like it's, it's difficult to get hold of. But if we can grasp hold of it and we can do it by design and deliberately, then we have a, have a, a real opportunity to, to engage people, get them bought in, get them running the same race as you, going the extra mile, feeling valued and feeling like they, they, they belong and that they're part of the journey, which enables you to work on the business to give them the environment to work in the business even more. I think a great way of doing this is to create manifestos. I think you can create a manifesto for your how we run a meeting. We run a meeting, open, honest, transparent. Everyone talks. They're chaired. They start on time. They finish on time. So you can have a little mini manifesto for a meeting. You can have a manifesto for the organization, which, which reflects the values that your organization has. So here's, a, here's a, a, a typical manifesto. But this tells you so much about the organization and how the organization behaves and what the organization believes in. Okay? So it starts off with, you know, we don't do sales pitches. We don't do sales pitches because we have conversations with clients. We are not suppliers. Yeah, we're partners. We don't, anyone talks about suppliers, we don't. That's not how we behave. Yeah, we will talk money. We'll talk money internally and externally. 
Money needs to be talked and discussed, so we will do that. We will discuss that. Yeah. We'll not become a master, we'll not become a jack of all trades and master of none. We are specialists in what we do. So I think that creating a manifesto for your organization becomes a, a little sheet that tells everyone what we're about, what we do, and what we don't do. And, and this should be created and written by your people. You can have a manifesto for the organization, you can have a manifesto for the culture. This is what we do, but we don't do that. This is what we do, but we don't do that. And actually, you have the opportunity to, to kind of almost rewrite, rewipe, refresh the business by saying, okay, guys, let's have a refresh on the first of next month. What are the things we hate doing? We hate, hate it when people come in late. We hate when we don't live on time. We hate when we don't collect money. What are the things we love about the business? We're a family. We do stuff together. We go out on a Saturday night. This is the stuff we've got to keep. This is the stuff we've got to lose. Let's go for it. Let's put it up on a board and let's make it happen. I really think that, that um, getting that sort of involvement and engagement in, in the journey makes the whole thing actually come together. So your agency is a people business. There's no way around it. You can claim it's a technology business. It's not. It's a people business. You've got to get the right people doing the right jobs, doing the right things. And I would argue that, that, that telling may not be the way to do that. You've got to be able to manage your talent. You've got to understand where, the, where you are in terms of your talent. So, so take an audit. Have an audit of where you are with the talent you've got, bearing in mind what the, what the challenges ahead are. You need to drive engagement. People need job descriptions. They need career paths. You need to work with them so that they know where they're going and what's expected of them and how they can perform. And you also need workforce planning. So that's about recruiting, retaining, and developing, and having those plans in place. So that's why I say, on the one hand, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Fantastic, I go along with that. I also say it's in praise of the dull stuff. It's about making stuff happen. So it's very much about everything that the Elevator program is about, which is, which is the journey. You need to take advantage of the elevated trainings. There, there are some really, you know, the elevator program is priority access to some specific things. It's priority access to boot camp through account managers. That's something you really need to take advantage of. It's sales training so that you understand better how to go through the sales process. It's a squared online, a four month program for your rising stars, yeah? Which, which gives you, amongst other things, you know, real great information about the digital marketing landscape that you're working in so you can understand but it gives you priority access and this opportunity well to my mind gives you the, gives you the, the space to kind of springboard your growth to to fast track it to take you up to the next level um, to make it happen but people is what undermine, undermines it the five step framework is a journey but the journey never finishes you get to the end you've got to start again but it really does seem to be based on people so first if you recall going back on the program first you set the vision what are the numbers you want to hit you know, then you figure out how you're going to grow the business what are the revenue targets what they're going to be how you're going to make that happen marketing engage with clients find ways of engaging and selling and selling to the right kinds of clients and then get your people working together and this is part of a bigger piece, but it's underwritten by the people. As many of you know, when your people piece starts going wrong, everything turns into a horrendous nightmare. It occupies so much, so much of your headspace. But when people are going right, you can't believe the power of the team and how great they are. It's absolutely fantastic. So this is the end of four Hangouts. Hangout one was what are the numbers? Planning. Hangout two is strategy. What is the roadmap? How are we going to make this stuff happen? Number three was marketing and number four is team. Really great organizations are obsessed with strategy, where are we going, marketing, how are we going to sell the stuff, teams are making it happen. This program and these, these um, videos are not about theory. They are all about taking action. And, and what you now need to do is, is figure out what is it you're going to do as a result of watching. Elevated program, very, very special. It's had some really, really remarkable results for, for clients and or other agencies that have been participating. Uh, and I can't wait to see even more results, even more success for agencies like yours. Thank you very much for watching.